Open in the name of the prayer. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down upon death by death, and to those in tombs he has granted life. Jesus, having risen from the grave, as he foretold, has granted us eternal life in his great mercy. Amen. 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 Truly the Lord is risen. Indeed. Everybody have a good Pascha. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Shrugs. Yeah, I guess. It was, I, mean, I mean, it was interesting. It was. It nice. was. I, I, I definitely got into it by, by Holy Saturday morning gospel. Nice. In time to arise. No, after after we arose, I did not. I did. I was not. I was not up for the erosion. Erosion. <laughs> did you Did you have Did you have bay leaves? I did have bay leaves. Bay leaves, not bay leaves. Bay, bay, bay leaves. <laughs> Sprinkled yeah. shirt of bay leaves. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have to be more articulate with my words. How now, brown cow? Mm. Um. So what are we Where talking we about this begin? week? Ah, thanks for the segue. Yeah, effortless. Yes, wonderful. I think I think um, we need to come back to the liturgy gospel. We've done the last two weeks. We did epistle and uh, and we did gospel. orthros gospel. Yeah, and I think now let's bring it. Let's bring it back. Full circle. The, yeah, back back to the divine liturgy gospel. Okay. So uh, for the Sunday following Pascha. I have a funny story about this one, actually. This is how my father, who was probably 55, um, realized that, that the readings of the church repeat are on a cycle. Uh -huh. So it was, it was Thomas Sunday. And he's like, do you guys all just like, do you guys all just decide to, to do Thomas on, on, the day, on the Sunday afterward? Like, how do you guys all decide to do the same thing all the time? <laughs> And I, I was like, Dad, there's like a strict schedule that everybody, like it written down hundreds of years ago about what gospels are read on what day. And he goes, really? You don't just like pick what you want to do that day? I'm like, Dude, you've been in the church for 55 years. How do you not know this? Like, you didn't realize that the same ones are said the same time of year, one after the other? Anyway, um, he discovered that on Thomas Sunday a, a few years ago. Yes. So, um the gospel reading is from the gospel according to John. We'll start uh, with the reading itself, and then we'll jump in. So on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. To the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Amen. 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 I love that gospel. Mm -hmm. been Tell me about it. I would have been disappointed if we went with a different, different reading for the day. Well, I'm glad that you got what you wanted. Well, I, that's why I rushed in to say which one we were going to do. Right. There's the, I mean, rush in. No, I'm going to start singing. Um, <laughs> There's so much to unpack in this gospel. There's a ton. I mean, we, I mean, from from of course Thomas, uh, Thomas um, to you know those last words of you know what was you know the other miracles and, and how that applies. So um, I think the easiest place to to start, I think, would be talking about poor uh, you know doubting Thomas. 
I think, you know, what, 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 what we hear about Thomas and what we, um, I mean, he's, we, we, as, I don't want to say as a church, because I don't think as, as a church we have, I don't want to say societally either, because although it's become a term doubt to become, to be a doubting Thomas, right? Yeah. That's a term because of this scene. Mm -hmm. And I think the question we should ask is, or the question that I think we've discussed is how fair or unfair is that to Thomas? Totally. Father, you I want to do it out there. The, the question has been thrown out there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's floating. Right. Yeah. The so blessing is there. Uh, <laughs> um, so, hmm. I think there's two ways to approach this. Number one, exonerates Thomas. And number two, implicates everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Say more about that. <laughs> Right, like you could say, no, Thomas was not necessarily, like, I guess it's your, it's your perspective, right? Do you, want to, do you want to save Thomas or do you want to doom everyone else? You could say that Thomas was not doubting, although I, the church is pretty clear that he was. Right. Mm -hmm. But I guess maybe the, the point that Nick, you're getting at, or, or my second point, which is like, you can implicate everybody else, is that like, Thomas didn't respond in any way different than the rest of the the 10 yeah right like that's i think that's what you're you're getting at like i i i'm not necessarily ready to say that like thomas did not show disbelief um you know that he was like totally solid um but i do want to to undermine the the term doubting thomas we can we can go ahead and just implicate everybody else because that's the christian thing to do is not take yeah. ownership for your own activities but to drag down everybody else <laughs> with you Everybody's under the bus. That's right. Um, That's that right. woman you gave me. <laughs> that, that was that all never got started there. Trouble. Right. Uh, she well, gave me the apple. But I think, I mean, so, so, so Christ appears first, the mm -hmm. first time. He appears the yeah. first time. And what does he say? He says, look at my hands, look at my side, right? He shows them and yeah. says. Because you know, back up a little bit, even right. Like when, when, the, when he appears to the disciples, that first group of disciples were huddled. Mm -hmm. They were afraid. They were hiding, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't recall that the, the text sort of explicitly talks about doubt maybe in the same sort of way, but they were definitely hiding from the authorities, right? Like, they, there was no kind of sense of confidence. There was no sense of, like, you know, the Lord is going to rise. Like, they, they thought their master was killed. They thought the authorities mm -hmm. were onto them. Like, there was definitely some level of panic and some level of on the defensiveness, which I think you can mm -hmm. interpret as, like, they, they, they didn't fully apprehend who Jesus was. So they were locked up in their room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then Jesus comes, like, like Nick says, and he's like, hey, guys, look. So he gives them exactly the same thing that he gives Thomas. Right. Yeah, Thomas. So the, the quote from the, from the scriptures is, you know, um, and he's, Jesus could stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Mm -hmm. And Jesus right. said to them again, peace be with you. Right. So like he starts off, he says, peace be with you. And then he has to show them his hands, his side. And only after they see, are they able to rejoice? Because they've already been told that this has happened. Yes, they have yeah, already I mean, been told, right? Uh, Peter and John run, go to the, go to the according, I mean, according to this, this, exact, this book, right? According to John, right. Peter and John go to the tomb. They don't see him, but they haven't seen him yet. Um, in another instance, you have Cleopas and who is Cleopas with on the road to Emmaus? Nicodemus. And, um, and they're like distraught and they say, furthermore, some women came to us and they're still not like, it's not until he reveals right. himself and everything mm -hmm. about the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so until they actually see him across the board, there is this level of, can we believe this? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and Thomas here now is, is given, um, I guess, an extra title that we don't typically apply to the rest of the disciples and we very much could. Right. I think it's important for us to take this before we get into Thomas and specifically what he asks, right? Like because there's a lot to, to focus on there, but if we look at just, we just look at, um, 
how Christ interacts with the 10 first. You know, he shows them his hands and his side, and then, then they believe, right? There's um, a parallel and Luke's telling of this, of this experience, of this event, um, in Luke uh, chapter 24, 36. So like, it's really helpful to see not just how John describes this event, but how Luke describes this event. And in John 24, 36, uh, or sorry, Luke 24, 36, he says, now as he said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you, right? So we're same, same setting. Um, but they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. Mm. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Then he said, uh, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and they marveled. He said to them, do you have any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb and he took it and ate in their presence. Hmm. And so Luke adds this extra detail that he tells them, you know, like not just look, like handle me, see, touch me. I like, I'm a real, like I have really risen from, from the dead, you know, physically, Thomas yeah. physically, right. Physically. Um, and so much, though, Luke even adds the point that like, they just, they were so doubting that after they saw, they still weren't like still disbelieved. And so Jesus had to eat. Yeah. Like he, yeah. Had, to, he had to eat a, a honeycomb to, to show them that like, yeah, not just the, not just the holes in my hands that you just touched, but you know, give me a piece of, of fish and, uh, and some honey so that I can eat and show you that like, and he does that a couple actually, times in his in his in his revealing. He he eats like, a couple uh, times, yeah. For yeah. Sure. And almost in every in everyone, if he does, even if he doesn't eat, like there is a food, something food or you know uh, there he breaks bread with Nicodemus and Cleopas. He you know like there is this he level eats, of he eats broiled fish on the on the shore uh, after yeah. the apostles or yeah, very fish much alive. Bread, yeah. Very yeah. much alive. That's I, th I think that right. that got to be and and it, that points to the you know for they thought that they saw a spirit and mm -hmm. had Christ risen in spirit, that would have been cool, <laughs> but it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been the fullness of what was necessary and what is for us as well in our resurrection uh, and what our, what it implies for us. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just want to just further drive home the imp like implicating everybody else, right? Like let's just get all of Thomas's co-conspirators together with him before we, we jump into Thomas. Um, if we look at Matthew, <laughs> the, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 16, the 11 disciples went into Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Mm. I, I love that. I love that line that that's put in there, by the way. Every time we read mm -hmm. things, that's one of the 11 gospels in, for, of Matins. It is. It's also the baptismal gospel. Okay. And, but, but some doubted, like, why do you, why, why mm -hmm. throw that in there? Except for the fact that it's true right. and it's real. Right. Right. Uh, I think only, I, only Mark doesn't include a, um, a piece about the disciples doubting Christ's resurrection. And in all, and if you look closely at Matthew, Luke, and John, it's more than just Thomas, Right. Matthew says some doubted, right? Implying more than just one, one doubted. Mm -hmm. um, John has the disciples needing to see his body and needing to see his hands in his side before they rejoice and then going to tell Thomas. And Luke mm -hmm. has them, you know, Christ actually has to tell them like, touch me. That's not enough. Fine. Give me a piece of fish and I'll show you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The point being. So it's constantly... Thomas gets a bad rap and again, not to absolve him of his doubt, right? Like that's something we can talk about, but that he is not alone in that experience. But that is, is almost a universal experience of his disciples. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's, 
I don't know if we want to sit on this. There's, there's something that kind of catches my eye as we're, as we're looking at John's gospel account in particular, right? Because Mm -hmm. so we get, we get Matthew who talks, well, Mm -hmm. we get Luke who talks about, you know, doubt, um, you know, in, in the days after the uh, resurrection, Matthew all the way sort of like forward to the ascension. And we still have doubts there as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, John is giving us an account of, again, just a few, a few few days uh, afterwards, there's still that level of doubt, but he had this interesting, this interesting wrinkle that kind of like, it's kind of out of time in the normal, uh, the normal timeline of the church, because he kind of comes to his disciples. He, you know, he shows them his hands and feet, right? He says, then they, then they're glad after he sees, uh, he shows them that. And then he gives them the Holy Spirit and Mm -hmm. he breathes the Holy Spirit upon them. And then when they go and they have this interaction with Thomas, like, then their doubts are alleviated and they actually sort of like confess him to Thomas in a way that they didn't before. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's interesting too, to potentially see the way that like that conf- the confession that we offer is something that is like even a gift of the spirit in its own way. Like the, the disciples in Matthew's account doubted at 40 days later at the foot of the Ascension, mm-hmm. Pentecost was still 10 days later, right. They still hadn't sort of received the fullness of the Lord. And that's when you see, you know, Peter give his, uh, his, his account in acts and so forth. Right. Um, this, this, I think interesting sort of like nugget that John gives us there. Like there's the doubt, this -hmm. doubt is this, and it's healed sort of with evidence, but it's also kind of healed with the gift of the Holy spirit, which is a deeper sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of really unlocks this faith. And we've kind of touched on that, I think in past uh, episodes as well, right. Talking about the place of the Holy spirit, talking about like the, the gift of grace, the gift of belief, um, but it's, it's very, it's very interesting to me that there's that kind of like, cause it's totally out of time. It's not a Pentecost that we see it in mm-hmm. John's gospel account, but we see receive the Holy spirit before the other disciples go to Tom, Thomas and say, we have seen the Lord like this, this kind of confession of this confession of who Jesus actually is, which I think is mm-hmm. super interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what do they say to like, how do they, what do they say to Thomas when they go to him? They say, we have, um, we have seen, seen the, the Lord. Lord, right? right. We've right. seen the Lord. Right. Yeah. But okay. Not so, just the teacher, not just the master, but like the Lord. Right. And then, right. And then Thomas, when Thomas sees, what does Thomas say? You are my Lord and my God. Right. Yeah. Right? That's, so that's not like a, a, a deeper uh, understanding of what he's viewing than even the apostle, the, the disciple saw at that point. Right. Right. Yeah. But um, it, going back, mistaken, going back to the, oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, in terms of the word Lord, why the lo- word Lord is so important too, right? If, 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 if I'm not mistaken, the word Lord, which is Gideos in Greek, right? That's the word in the Septuagint that is used as like the translation of the name of God in the Old Testament, like Yahweh. I think like, isn't, it, isn't that frequently the way that it's translated in the Septuagint? Eh, not, not, I mean, it is, but they also, they use Gideos for, for Yahweh but they also use it more generally. By the time Greek is being used for the scriptures, Kyrios has a, a whole host of meanings and it's not, it's not specific, right? If you're in the Old Testament, yeah, um, they use Kyrios for, for Yahweh, but it's not exclusive, right? Like Hebrew has multiple different names for, for God, Yahweh being yeah. like his name and then everything else being a characteristic of, of his name. And when you see yeah. that in English translations, it's usually like the Lord God um, is how mm. we'll often translate that Hebrew Yahweh. But the Greek doesn't, it uses Kyrios for Yahweh, but it also uses Kyrios for Elohim and El. And it's not as, it's not as um, specified as the Hebrew is. So, okay. no. Um, so maybe that's why thomas is like my lord and my god is that much more like pointed and specific like there's no ambiguity about that statement at the very least Mm -hmm. so there's uh there's a great who is it saint gregory oh i was gonna say there's a great quote by by saint gregory the great too many greats in that sentence um about thomas's just because we're down we're now on this road um about thomas's explanation or exclamation um and when christ says to him you know um do you believe because you have seen? So uh, St. Gregory uh, comments and he says, quote, uh, things that are evident no longer involve faith, but only recognition. Why then uh, when Thomas saw and when he touched, was it said to him, you know, um, you have believed because you have seen, because he saw one thing and he believed another. 
divinity could not be seen by a mortal person. He saw a human being and he confessed him as God. And so St. Gregory is making the point that what he's asking to see, Christ's flesh, he's asking to see a human being resurrected, right? And that's what he sees. He sees a human being with holes in his hands, right? But what he perceives can't be seen. Because he perceives and my Lord and my God. He perceives my Lord and my God, right? He sees a, a human person. Yes, mm. a, I'm going to say a, a resurrected, transformed human person. Like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, right. but he sees a human. Right. Yeah. But what he confesses is my Lord and my God. And so St. Gregory is saying that, like, he actually, you know, when you get past the initial point of doubt, where he lands is a deeper ex exclamation than simply just the resurrection, right? Because he can see and proclaim that this man who was crucified is alive. Yeah. He can see that, right? That no longer, and what St. Gregory is saying is like, that no longer involves faith. That's only recognition. Yeah. Right? To confess that Jesus is alive is not necessarily for Thomas because he has seen an act of faith. But Thomas believes because he sees not simply a human who is resurrected, but he sees his Lord and his God. He's not and just seeing Thomas, another Lazarus, in other words. He's not, right. not just seeing another. Right, right, right. Hmm. So he had doubt about maybe the resurrection of, of, Christ's, human, of Christ's humanity, right? He has doubt, but once he sees that, that there's no longer faith that's involved there because that's just fact. He stands right. in front of and physically handles the risen Lord's body, right? Like it's no longer a proclamation of faith to say Jesus has risen for Thomas, right? Right, Because Thomas is what Thomas has seen, right? And what he's saying is what he can't see, but still knows and still believes is my Lord and my God. And therefore we see Thomas's faith expressed there. And then you get, you know, blessed are all those who have not seen and yet believe. All of us, and the fathers of the church are very specific, like all of us who have not yet seen and stood in front of the physical risen Lord, we proclaim both, right? Thomas didn't need to proclaim the resurrection. Right. Him personally, right? As he goes and he ministers and he's an apostle, he does. Right. But for him, it's obvious. It's, it's, it's fact. It's fact. Right? right. And so all, so we have this dual confession that we need to, that we need to see or, or perceive that we need to perceive. Right. Um, or confess his right. physical resurrection and his divinity. Whereas for Ooh, Thomas, yes. right. Whereas for Thomas, that's, he only has one confession to make my Lord and my God. Right. Which is still groundbreaking. Still totally groundbreaking. Right, because in the end, what does it mean? My Lord and my God is, is a physical person in front of me. Right, which is otherwise unheard of among the Jews, right? Yeah. Like yeah. God would be, you know, and, like, and, that, and that's the essence of the gospel, that God became man. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now he's, and, and, and he, you know, throughout the, all of the ministry, uh, there were times when like Peter prof professed it, but like now we see him in a risen state mm -hmm. as, as God mm -hmm. and as a human form. I mean, like everything's confirmed. Like it's just right there. So I want to go back a little bit, if I, if, if I may, to when the disciples tell Thomas. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I read a great article um, by a priest in the, in, in the metropolis who I, I know very well, Father Mark Zitzema, who wrote an article called Doubting, Doubting Thomas. And this is this really to me the, this was uh, really groundbreaking in my understanding of of doubting Thomas. And one of the points he makes is, um, if you're Thomas and you're one of the twelve, right? You're one of the closest friends, and Christ arrives to to tell the other disciples, and you're not there. Like, like, wouldn't you kind of be like, well, I wasn't here for that. Right? Why? Why would he appear, appear to you, but not to me? Right? 
-hmm. So like this doubt doesn't come without a little bit of, um, I mean, you can, it's, it's understandable. Like I'm one of you guys, why didn't he appear when I was here? You know, and, and that, that's, uh, I think, I think just a general true human emotion that I am one of you. I'm, I'm, I'm now, I, feel, I mean, like totally left out. I mean, really, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a real human emotion that I am mm -hmm. left out of this. And, and, you know, if you guys got to see it, then I want to see it. You know, that's, do you want to know when Thomas is really left out? Is that talk Yeah. So, I mean, like, Thomas is always just not there. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, I don't feel as bad for Thomas in this situation because there's no, there's no context about like why he's not there. But I feel really bad for him when the Theotokos falls asleep, mm -hmm. right? Because before, um, before she dies, um, before she falls asleep, all of the apostles who are out doing their, their apostolic, you know, missionary work are all mystically transported in a cloud. The, the writings say, you know, like they were enwrapped in a cloud and brought from wherever they were to her bedside, all of them, except for Thomas. <laughs> and Thomas arrived a couple of days later after she had already fallen asleep. Everybody else got to say goodbye, but Thomas didn't. Like he physically traveled. I don't know, but he, but he, just, did, he just didn't get there. And everybody else got like an express, you know, divine cloud transportation and Thomas didn't. So, but, it's, but, but Thomas serves the same purpose. This is say. Right? Like, and I don't, and again, this is why kind of just going back to exonerating Thomas. And not exonerating him from, from doubt. Like, we can talk about his doubt in a second. I think we should. Mm -hmm. um, but, but singling him out is, is what we're trying to, um, we're trying to erase that perception, right? That Thomas was unique among the disciples for his doubt. Um, I'm not, he has doubt, and we'll get to that. But the point is, Thomas has the exact same thoughts and, and fears as the rest of them. He has to actually physically see Christ before he will confess him. That's the exact same experience the other 10 had. Like we cannot single out Thomas and say that he was different from them. He was just not there. Mm -hmm. And he expressed the exact same doubt that they all did. They just had the opportunity to see him before going to tell Thomas. Yeah. Right. And he and asked so, for the very same thing that Jesus gave the other disciples. Yeah. And he asked to experience he has to be united to the disciples, right? Mm -hmm. He has to not be, he, he specifically asked not to be separate from them, right? If everybody else got to see you and handle you like you offered, then I want that too, right? Like I'm not going to believe until I can have the exact same experience that you guys all have, right? Maybe, you know, to Nick's point about feeling left out. But the yeah. point that I'm making is that he's not there. Therefore we get this story of of him for lack of a better word needing proof that confirms the that confirms the resurrection right he's not there when the panayia falls asleep therefore we get his experience um of her being being assumed and leaving her belt to him right um so thomas is you know not being present is actually it's a, it's a, it's a benefit to the church. Oh, absolutely. It's a it I mean, like, purpose. It totally does. And, and that's why, you know, again, not to malign, there's no reason to malign Thomas. I think that's what we're getting right. at. Like, like, I don't, we shouldn't preach that Thomas was, was different or worse than the other disciples. And we shouldn't preach that, you know, like he just wasn't there or he was more scared than the rest of them or whatever it was. Thomas is not being there was, was the, providence and grace of, of, of the Holy Spirit so that we could hear the truth of the physical resurrection of Christ so that we could hear the assumption of the Virgin Mary, right? Like it's, it's, it's good. Right. That's, that's just, at least that's the, the point that I want to make. It, it was, his lack of presence is good. We talk mm -hmm. about this. We've talked about this a few times that the, the, um, the impact that these gospel stories have on us today. Mm -hmm. um, it, what happens is, is 
uh, important for what happened as it happens. And it's important for us 2000 years later uh, to be a part of that in our way. So here mm -hmm. now Christ says, um, blessed are those who believe without seeing. Well, you know, and now you mentioned this, mm -hmm. who is that directed to? Mm -hmm. That's directed to us, right? And, and so that purpose, that what that is said is is said as basically as an encouragement to us. Is that not? Oh, one hundred percent. So my then my question to that is, what does it? What does he mean when he says, "Blessed are those who believe without seeing"? What does that mean? Because I think it comes off as you're not blessed, Thomas, and you don't get my blessing. And I think that's how it's read. Right. But I'm not. And that's sure what that's I was saying. Like, I think that's what mm -hmm. I think that's what Saint Gregory the Great was getting at. What you're what you're saying is that it's not it's not necessarily denying Thomas a blessing, but it's recognizing the blessing that's upon him is because he confessed the divinity, which he right. could not see. Right. Right. Like, it's I think the point that Saint Gregory the Great is making is is exactly that. It's not that it's not that Christ is denying Thomas a blessing or chiding him or chastising mm -hmm. him like oh, well, you didn't get it. Well, everybody else who gets it without, you know, like everybody else who didn't have to doubt, you know, well, they're going to be extra blessed and you're just, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, Gregory is making the point that he believes what he can't see, mm. which is the divinity. Mm -hmm. He can't see that. You can't see it. Right. Right. So to us today, would you say that, for instance, um, there are people who um have this desire and need to see miraculous things weeping icons mm -hmm. um you know whatever and then there's people who um don't they don't need it they, they just don't need to see these things there's, it's not something that they like have a desire to see their faith is there would you say that there's um they have just that, that's like i would say that it's a blessing to not have to not, to not have to need that it's it's I, I, it would be a blessing to was it was that is that what he's referring to here or no like i'm like you like if i don't need to see that thing then then you're you're blessed that you don't have to see it is that what he's referring to for the rest of us no no okay. i don't think i don't think so because i mean like i get what you're saying which is you know for some people the the miraculous workings of of god within the world and um the the visible and tangible expressions of his grace strengthen their faith and there's others where not denying those those experiences but it doesn't necessarily add to their faith is if i'm getting what you're saying right, right? Yep. like they're mm -hmm. they're it's it's not that i don't believe in those things but i would believe the same whether they happened or not right, right. is that what you're okay. yeah and and that those people are blessed whereas the other people are not just that it's a yeah it's a blessing not not that like god's given them a blessing necessarily or like they're more blessed but Right. I'll, you know, I'm blessed that I don't need that type of, you know, like, like yeah. that kind of thing. Is but see, I, I see here. My thing is that like, to put it in the terms of need, right? Like, it doesn't matter what you like. God, God isn't, God isn't, I don't think that God, you know, pours his grace upon, upon the world and acts within the physicality of our, of our created being to display and show forth his grace and his mercy and his, his energy. Um, because we need it right like i don't know if that's making, making well i don't know I, I mean i guess i mean i'm going down a little bit of a tangent like need here. to see it right like like oh i'm doing this because this person needs to see like you know they're not going to believe if i don't do that right but i think there are there is a level i think for some for some that um their faith is strengthened when they see something that is miraculous in this world right so right. I agree. I agree. But I think that you're, I think that I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that it's a, it's a, it's a constructed and a false dichotomy that like, okay. that, you know, one is, one is different from the other. Or one is better than the other. Right. Like it's, it's the conversation we have, unless you're like, no, even, even when St. John Chrysostom writes about like the beauties of, of, of virginity over living in the world or when St. Gregory of Nyssa for sure writes about it. Yeah. Um, and like says that one's better, right? Like he's, t he's writing to monastics, right? Like right, I yeah. think sometimes the, that, that dichotomy of, and I'm just using this as an example mm -hmm. of, you know, like one being a higher calling than the other is, is ridiculous. Um, right. And I'm not and saying, then, and then, well, um, 
I, I'm so I want to apply that same to uh, to this, like people who appreciate. I'm going to use appreciate, right? Like people who who appreciate miraculous um, experiences against people who I don't want to say don't appreciate it, but you know don't find as much I don't helpful. Know. Well, so here's. I, I, I'm trying to walk a, a very tight line well, here. Right. No. Right. So. So. For instance, I, I'll. I. I feel like sometimes I'm not as moved. Let's say, mm -hmm. um, when I see something that is as miraculous as a mer streaming icon, or mm -hmm. something like that, as someone who is like just moved by it. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's not a negative thing one way or the other. I don't. I don't think. I don't see it that way. I don't. I don't. I don't see it as something that like I need to have that that movement inside me, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time I, I wonder if, uh, and I, I don't I guess I don't want to equate a blessing to something that's greater in level of anything other than that, you know blessed. I mean I feel I feel sometimes I feel in some ways sometimes blessed that I don't that I don't that like that. I think I think what you're describing Nick is what we would call spiritual pride. Maybe yeah, but, but I, I don't. I don't. I don't like is a like. No offense to you, sure. but I mean like. Go ahead. I you know I need to see it versus I don't need to see. It. Like I'm blessed. I don't need to see this. I don't. I, I believe whether I have this icon or not. You know, instead of just yeah. being like the icon is there, right? Like. Yeah. Well, so okay. yeah, look, a, a thought. Right? I'm trying Which, not to come down on on either side, and I I right. think that the ben the, I think the reality is. Like. If that, if, if that works for you, it works for you, right? If it doesn't, it doesn't. But like one's not better than the other. And, and No, right. And I think that's what I'm trying to say, though, is that one's not better than the other. And this blessing is not a thing that like God is, is like, I bless you, but I don't bless you. And I bless you and I don't bless you. And it's mm -hmm. not a matter of like, like Christ denying us, denying a blessing. But there is a level of like, we don't need to see it. We know it's there. But it exists. It's real, you know. But even, yeah, but also, even so, I think. I, I, but I think. I think to keep in mind though, too, right? It's like all of us need something. Mm -hmm. All of mm -hmm. us need something. I mean, even just like going to the next verse in in John's Gospel, he says, you know, Jesus did many other signs in the presence. They're not all written here, but those that are written here are that you may believe. You know, I mean, like, like it's not necessarily something that we've seen, but would we believe without? John's writings? Would we believe without the testimony of, of, of the saints? I mean, all of us do need something in order to get to that posture of, of, of belief, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe I didn't need an icon or whatever it is, but I needed to hear the gospel from somebody. I needed the scripture. It's not like I stumbled onto this, you know, revelation in, in, in a, in a sort of universe, in a, in an individualistic, whatever, like something, I, something that I saw, the, something that the I heard. Universe didn't, it is. The universe didn't reveal it to you? I mean, you know, the heavens proclaim the glory of God, right? But um... so I don't mean to, I don't mean to like split hairs so much here, but I guess what I'm trying to ask ultimately is what does Christ mean when he says, blessed are those who need not see yet believe? What does I that think mean? He's, I think he's, I think it's very obvious. Okay. I think it's exactly what we've been talking about that like, and again, the fathers of the church talk about this, right? Like outside of that room, it's every it's the rest of creation, right? Like outside of those 10, 11 at this point, like it's the rest of the world. Right. right. And again, okay. going back to, going back to um, Thomas and Thomas's exclamation, like Thomas still is seeing something physical and believes the, and believes the, what cannot be seen. Mm. Gotcha. All right. So right? like, I think it, I think it just applies to everybody. Right. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Right. And, and I think, and the reason why I'm bringing this up specifically is because I, I think that in some way or another exonerates Thomas a little bit because it is read very often that I'm denying you a blessing, Thomas, because you needed to see it. This is a very long path to get to that point. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is a discussion. This is, I'm a little thick headed. So, uh, this is our podcast. We do what we want. Yeah. Um, no, again, I don't, I would not, I would not say that it is, it is being said critically of Thomas. Okay. I think, I think a close reading 
a close reading with the guidance of the of the the fathers see that ne not necessarily as a a chastisement of Thomas, but a promise to the rest, and maybe a confirmation in in Gregory's way of thinking, in Gregory's um, illumination by the Holy Spirit, um, a way of understanding that Thomas is proclaiming something greater and deeper that is unseen. Mm. So it's a thumbs up to everybody. It's not a withholding of blessing from anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry for taking the wrong, the long way to get there. Participation trophies all around. <laughs> Good job, kids. <laughs> yep. You all did it, even if you didn't. <laughs> it's okay. Jesus is the race. He's the one who runs the race. None of us yeah. do it at the end of the day anyway. It's true. All right, so I've got two things, um, two Two other topics we can kind of meander towards um, before we open for questions. Um, it's I'll give you one is one is um, more like in depth uh, scriptural connections, and the other is more general like thematic takeaways. One is probably more spiritually edifying for anybody else who will watch this, and one is more nerdy. That's what. That's how I should say. It. Deep dive, deep dive, deep dive. I, I'm, I'm, I'm all about this uh, option two. <laughs> <laughs> option two can be done in like two minutes. I'll do option two. Um, okay. Again, we'll go back to like not necessarily exonerating Thomas um, of doubt. It's very clear he has doubt, but noticing that his doubt is the same as everybody else, like qualifying. And the whole boat's sinking, right? Not just one, not just one person. Um, but, you know, ultimately the question of like, well, what is, what are the results or what are the fruits of Thomas's doubt? Which I think is an important um, pastoral conversation, an important pastoral gloss on, on this is that um, Thomas hears, hears that Christ is, Christ is risen and that the disciples have seen the Lord. And, doesn't refuse to join them the next time that they're meeting in eight days, right? Like his doubts, it's not like he insists, like, I'm not going to believe this. And it's just, you know, it's hogwash. And I'm going to, I'm going to go back and do whatever I was doing before. Um, he doesn't, he has doubts, right? But he doesn't write it off. And his doubts actually lead him in back to the upper room where he sits in doubt, right? Like he's, he's in the room in doubt, surrounded by people who are telling him that, you know, this is what we've seen and this is what it is. And I can't, you know, I just feel like that's a very universal experience in the church to be in the church um, and to be struggling with doubt while you feel like everybody else around you is either stronger than you or has said so, or has seen something that you haven't seen. Um, but I think the, the guidance that Thomas gives us is, is to, when in, when in doubt, like, don't, don't leave, right? Like, yeah. right. And the, the other disciples, they tell him, we've seen the Lord. And then he gives them this kind of like this response and they don't attack him for it. And they don't beat him over the head for, for his doubts. They invite him and make sure that he's with them the next time that they gather together. Right. Like, so his doubt doesn't cast him out of the group mm -hmm. from their from their perspective yeah. and his doubt doesn't lead him to leave the group right. from his perspective and ultimately what what happens is he ends up with his hands outstretched right like his doubt actually leads him to go further and further and deeper and deeper into a mystery Right. So well, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's such an important aspect, I think, of growth as an Orthodox mm -hmm. Christian is allowing doubt to enter and, mm -hmm. and not saying, well, I, I doubt now, peace. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's a real struggle, I would say, for our generation specifically. Um, and I think part of that is it's twofold. In one end, it's exactly what you're saying in that, you know, I feel uncomfortable because I have this doubt and instead of pursuing and going down this, down this path of mystery to, to maybe find answers or whatever, 
Um, I'm just, it's easier for you to just take a step, step out. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think there's been a lot of instances, at least anecdotally, I, I mean, I could think of a few, um, where someone who experienced doubt or questions something in our faith gets ostracized for their legitimate questions. And as a church, as, a, as someone who, a, a Christian, as a, someone who's a member of, uh, of, of a church, I think it's really important to say what, to, to show this as an example, both on Thomas's side and on the apostle, on the disciple side of right. how to handle a situation where there is doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's, that's a great example. So I'm just taking what you're saying and, and just kind of broadening it for us and, and saying, I think we've all seen it. Yeah. It's, it's very much in the spirit of what was it? The Sunday of St. Mary, the, the father of the boy that was demon possessed Mm -hmm. who had his doubts, right? Because the disciples weren't, weren't healing. And yet his mm -hmm. doubts didn't pull him away, right? Number one, mm -hmm. just like Thomas. And then number two, he, his, doubts are, his doubts are responded to with gentleness, right? Mm -hmm. Like Jesus didn't sort of go and ostracize. We had that whole sort of deep dive into the, the sort of like the, the semantics of, you know, Jesus talking to the man. He doesn't come at him with chastisement. He comes at him with this kind of like encouragement and hope. And mm -hmm. in the same way, like it's, it's really wonderful, right? Tom, like Thomas is, is doubting. And Jesus gives him like exactly what he needs to resolve his doubts. Right. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't shame him. Doesn't sort of like paint him out to be the doubting Thomas, the worst of the disciples or anything like that. Um, and I think that's a really like interesting, like Nick was saying, like a really interesting pastoral challenge. Like how do we, how do we respond to the doubts of our friends, to the doubts mm -hmm. of our fellow parishioners, right? The doubts of family members. Is it, is it something that makes us scared? Is it something that's going to cause us to be on the defensive or is it mm -hmm. like, the conditions in which ministry happens, right? Like that is, that is where the Lord ministers to Thomas in the midst mm -hmm. of his doubts. Right. Um, and I think that's, I think that's a big, again, just because the three of us are involved in, in ministry, like I think the missteps of the, of, of people in ministry or people in the church is that when there are questions or doubts that they are either, that they're not engaged with, right. They're either dismissed or they're, or unsatisfactory answers are, are provided. Um, and I also, I also feel like we either feel like we have to provide an answer or we have to tell you like, well, just accept it on faith, right? Like Thomas, Thomas was not told, Thomas was not told like, well, you just have to believe. Yeah. Suck it up. Right. He wasn't said, he didn't say like, well, you know, this is where faith comes in. You know, when, when, you know, science stops working, that's where faith, you know, like, this, this, that's not what happens. Right. He's like, he's like, unless I see this, this is going to happen. And no one was like, dude, you better just shut up and believe, right? Like, <laughs> you're a bad guy for asking that question. Right. Uh, how can you be, how can you consider yourself a follower of Christ if you won't automatically believe, you know, the thing that we've all seen and are telling you happened that you didn't see happen? I mean, like, that's, this was happening today. Um, and uh, anyway, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, I think there's, there, I mean, there's, there's that empathy though, that has to come in from the apart from the disciples' point of view, mm -hmm. right? The empathy that we were just like you, too. We were, we, we, we needed to see too, mm -hmm. and we did, and you didn't, <laughs> and you know, so the, you know, we, our faith. I think sometimes when we get to a point of, of, um and more developed faith, we forget that at some point that faith had to develop. <laughs> like it can't, it didn't just come from, from nowhere. It came from mm -hmm. somewhere, you know, we were, we were baby Christians and we continued to grow and maybe by the grace of God, and maybe mm -hmm. I've reached some level of adolescence in my Christian, you know, mm -hmm. there's an empathy that the apostles uh, had to have um, as they continued their ministry with every pe person they met and every church they built and every, you know, from that point forward, that this is a big deal and this could be hard to believe for someone. Mm -hmm. And I think when we go into ministry and we talk to people and we spread the good news that we have to understand that this is a difficult thing for some people to grasp and that's okay. It doesn't make it less true, but it's something that we have to, to, to wrestle with. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that empathy is a big part of this. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right, well, we've got about five minutes left before we're scheduled to, to wrap up. Can um, I make one quick, one quick point? One quick point. It's a quick point. Just that um, it gets glossed over so often, but that Christ had so many more met, uh, miracles that were not recorded in this book. Um, I think that just points to a, a greater um, directive towards or d- direction towards tradition and to understanding that like it's not all containable in the Bible. It can't possibly be containable all mm-hmm. in the Bible mm-hmm. and that there's more that Christ did and continues to do that is that involves a human experience. And, mm-hmm. um, and I think that becomes a stumbling yeah. block for a lot of people, especially our, uh, some of our Western Christian friends. Um, but I think it's a really important verse. So I don't know. I just wanted and to point that out. There is literally nothing in the scripture that says everything is here. Right. Right. Quite the opposite. Right. Yeah. You know, That's there's this, there's Paul, I think in, in Thessalonians, he talks about like the, the teachings that I've given you by word and by writing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's a good, I think that's a good word. Yeah. As, as father said, questions, thoughts. There's um, a question. The question from Mama Leonis at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, my mother asks, uh, <laughs> do they doubt because they do not recognize him because he looks different? i.e. Like, like spirit, like kind of how Nicodemus and Cleopas didn't recognize him. Yeah. Right. And Mary Magdalene outside the tomb doesn't recognize him. Right. It's yeah, so constant, constantly throughout the, the scriptures after his resurrection, people are not recognizing him because he looks, he's, he's just not recognizable. Yeah. He's transformed. Same yet different. Same yet different. You know, because it's interesting that when he, he shows Thomas, like it's the same holes, you know, the same holes that when he was mm-hmm. hanging on the cross, right? So it's clearly still him, but there's something unrecognizable. And I, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting note to us, right? As Christians, like how do we recognize the Lord? Um, mm-hmm. Like we recognize him in the Holy Spirit. We recognize him in his revelation. We re- and when we look at like Luke, right? The, that uh, Cleopas and Nicodemus, they recognize him in the breaking of the bread. Mm-hmm. They recognize him in, in, the, in the liturgy. They recognize him in his body and blood. There is a kind of like a, a mystical sort of like sacramental revelation. We don't see him walking around in the same way as they did for 40 days after the, the resurrection, but mm-hmm. he's present with us and we see him in the breaking of the bread and we see him by the grace of the, of the Holy Spirit. And that's, I think, one of the, the, the joys and challenges of the Christian life. Well, so does that point to... Um this level of like of participation that some things need to be revealed to us as we participate in the life of the church. So there's certain, um, you know, I guess my, my response to this would be um, that Christ is, I mean, he looks like, he looks like he does, um, but he's, he's recognizable in response or people's ability to recognize him. Mm-hmm right, in proportion to their ability to recognize him, right? So, um, and that's a theme that's, that's pretty consistent throughout the scriptures, even prior to his, uh, even prior to his crucifixion and resurrection on uh, Mount Tabor, the hymns for transfiguration, when he showed forth his, his divinity to his disciples, right? It's, it says, you know, he showed them, he showed them his divinity in, in as much as they could bear or as far as they were able. Um, and um, um, both Saint Gregory the Theologian and Saint Cyril of Jerusalem make this same comment, but in reference to receiving the Holy Spirit. But I think it, it applies to the recognition aspect. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll read both of these and then we'll go back and I'll, I'll see, kind of explain more. So mm-hmm. in reference to Christ offering the Holy Spirit, breathing on them, and then them getting the Holy Spirit again at Pentecost. This is what St. Gregory the Theologian says. Um, Christ's disciples were able to receive the Spirit on three occasions. Uh, but, and he goes on, I'm going to jump to later in the quote. He says, the first manifested him indistinctly, the second more expressly, and this present one, this is in his post, uh, Pentecost oration. So in this present one, more perfectly. So he's saying that in the beginning, they received the Holy Spirit indistinctly, then more expressly when they're there with Thomas 
and then at Pentecost more fully, right? So he's drawing out this theme of as they're able to receive it, they receive it in a greater proportion. And then Cyril of Jerusalem in his catechetical homily says, um, receive it in part now, then you shall wear it in fullness. For the one who receives often possesses only a part of the gift, but the one who is clothed is completely enfolded in his robe. Again, both of these are um, in reference to Pentecost and the ability to receive and recognize or receive the Holy Spirit, right? Um, I think that that, again, is the same thing that we're seeing in terms of people's ability with their physical eyes to recognize Christ. Like Cleopas and Nicodemus couldn't physically recognize him. Again, maybe not because he looked different, but because they couldn't see him. Mm -hmm right? Their eyes were not able to see him, not that Christ was shielding himself from him, from them. Mary Magdalene, again, not able to see him in the garden, not necessarily because he looked different, but because her eyes were not able to see him. Mm. And what it is, you know, what is it? It's when he turns to Mary and says her name, that she can recognize the person standing in front of him, of her. And when Cleopas and Nicodemus sit down and break bread and receive his body and blood, that they can recognize him, right? When they participate in that sacrament. And a great example of this is in, um, again, in John, when they go fishing um, and they see Christ on the beach and he's got a little like charcoal fire for them. It says that they recognize that he's the Lord, right? Like this is happening after, um, Thomas Sunday, uh, where is this? Um, when, when was it? It was after, yeah, after they go fishing. So it's in, it's in the next chapter after this, right? So he's already appeared to them once and they're able to see him. And it says that they know that, that it's, that it's him. Um, I love this part. Yeah, like, so, so therefore the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, he said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon heard it, uh, Peter heard it, um, that it was the Lord. He put on his garment um, where he was stripped for work and plunged into the sea. And then everybody else came in the boat. Like they saw him. And at this point, when he tells them to cast their net on the side, they know that it's the Lord. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, again, not necessarily that he's different, I mean, obviously he is, he's resurrected, right? Like that's, that's the, I'm, I'm conceding that point. What I'm saying is the inability to recognize him is, is a proportion to their, is a response from them, not necessarily a concealment of himself. Yeah, hmm. which, which connects to Nick's point earlier about like us being baby Christians and kind of our spiritual progress. Um, and the more, hopefully, the more we sort of grow in holiness, the more our eyes are opened to the, the reality of what is. Um, in the same way that sort of, you know, the disciples go from baby Christians, right, to full. I mean, this is like what Paul talks about, right? Our goal as Christians is to, is to achieve the full stature of Christ, mm -hmm. um, to be able to see things for, for, for who they are, to be able to see the Lord for who he is, to see, mm -hmm. to see him in our midst. Um, like even like he, Jesus even talks about this in his, um, like his farewell discourse on the, the night of the Last Supper. Like he tells the disciples, like, I, I'm going from you. The world will not see me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right but like you will be able to see me mm -hmm. it's not that i'll be gone like i'll be here but the, the the world will not be able to see me and as you sort of like develop in your faith and your and your spiritual lives you will be able to see me right mm -hmm. this is why there's not like you know breaking news all across galilee and and judea that you know christ is this, this guy that we just crucified is up and walking around like no one else besides his disciples see him it's not because he's not there it's because no one else has eyes to see mm. But yeah. he does he does reveal himself to a multitude of people over a period of time. Yeah, but all people who like have eyes to see. Right, right, right. Right, like which is his preaching expect... throughout the whole his whole thing. His, his preaching throughout his his earthly ministry was those who have ears to hear, those who have eyes to see, those you mm -hmm. know, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to pick up some of what. Uh, Susan was saying in the in the chat before we wrap up. I know we're a little bit over, um, but I do. You know, Susan said um, we understood that during this time Christ is choosing to reveal Himself at given times. I think we kind of addressed that um, after the resurrection. Christ could no longer be Mary's body's child, recognizable as such. Um, I would 
wholeheartedly disagree with that because that would deny the reality of his incarnation and and his his person uh, i mean like his his physical human human nature right like it's transformed what we need to be what we need to understand is that it's transformed right but it's not new and it's not different hmm. right like as a person uh, right right like it's it's it needs we need to be clear that it's the same body Right? right. Like if it weren't the same body and the fathers of the church are very clear, like the whole point, the, the whole reason that he's trying to, um, that he's showing his physical self is to show that like, I, it is me. It is the same person. It is my same, same holes. physical, same it, holes. Right. His uh, incarnation, his incarnation mm -hmm. carries into his resurrection. Right. Yes. Right. Right. I think that's yeah, really otherwise. Clear. Yeah. Right. It's the same body. Right. right. It's the it's the exact same body. Right. It's now it is now received the full healing of its humanity. Right. Like it is what it is the human nature as human nature was intended to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fully vivified and and triumphed over death. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. but it's still the same. It's still the same body. Mm -hmm. Can I can I lean into this even a little bit more? Um, lean. Because because it's not just the resurrection. It's even to the ascension. Right. So like when Christ ascends physically to sit uh -huh. at the right hand of the mm -hmm. father, like that is the same body that he was born with, the same body that was crucified, the same body that mm -hmm. rose from the tomb. Right. Otherwise, I, I think it's otherwise, because again, it's all, it's all the work of salvation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's Stan Aloy who has, for me, a line that always resonates. Like when he talks about the, the, the sort of fruit of the ascension, you know, a, a beating human heart or a human heart beats at the center of the Trinity or something along those lines, like Stan Aloy has this, to, to really underscore the fact that like Jesus physically ascends to the right hand of the Father. Like, you know, whatever that means, right? Like that's, I, I can't wrap my, where does he go? Like, I can't wrap my mind around that. But like there is a, a human heart that is beating in the Trinity because the Son of God mm -hmm. continues mm -hmm. to be incarnate. Well, and I think- I think it's beautiful. We, we talk a little bit about like, well, what's my body going to be like in heaven? Am I going to have my 12 year old self? Am I going to have my 24 year old self? Am I going to have 33? Right. Um, okay. and I, and, well, we don't know, but there is a transformation that happens within us. Right. That, that, that question comes up. That question yeah. comes up. And so there is a, it's, it's, it's us very much us. It is our body. But what does that mean beyond like it's beyond our fallen nature? of what this body is like right now I'm 33 and my back might hurt. Right. Um, <laughs> but right. in my, you know, if I die when I'm God willing, if old age, um, you know, do I go back to when my, my 33 year old self? Well, if that's the case, my back still hurts. Right. But it's beyond that. And, and, and I think, no. I think that's what we, we have to understand here, even with Christ that it's, it's beyond, it's still that body, but it's beyond, the aches and pains and things that that come with a 33 year old self yeah right like may, maybe this is a, a concrete way to think about it like the beginning of this gospel reading like right at the very top it says you know on the evening of that day the first day of the week the doors being shut suddenly jesus comes and stands in front of them like mm -hmm. this is like this this resurrected body like a locked doors are not uh are, don't get in the way right right Right. Like there's, it's, it's still his body, which, which you could still, you know, see the holes in whatever it is. Like he could still eat broiled fish and he could still, but somehow locked doors were not an impediment to him. What does that mean? Oh, right. Yeah. I think, I think we're trying to emphasize and I'll, I'll kind of conclude, conclude with this, that like, it's the same, it's the same body, but it is transformed. And I right. think the, the umbrage that, that we, we were taking was with the statement that it's no longer Mary's body's child because to be no longer Mary's body's child would to be no longer Mary's child. And right. to say that it's no longer from her physicality would to be deny her ability to give birth to God. And I think that's where we were taking um, a hard line stance and that it is the same physicality. It is transformed in the same way that my wife gave birth to my child who was one and my child who is now six, it's the same body, but he has been radically transformed through that process, right? right? right. Um, and we need to understand transformation and continuity. 
it is the same body. It is Mary's child's body mm-hmm. to just like take that direct quote from the question, but it is different and transformed from what it was to become what it was intended to be. Yeah. Praise okay. God and Christ is risen. Truly. Yes, verily, unto him. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was so much about some Nicholas right there. <laughs> uh let's uh let's conclude with with prayer and thank you uh thank you all very much and beheld the resurrection of christ let us worship the holy lord jesus the only sinless one we venerate your cross of christ and your holy resurrection we praise and glorify for you are god and we know no other but you we call upon your name come all faithful let us venerate the christ's holy resurrection Behold, through the cross, joy is coming to all the world. Ever blessing the Lord, praising his resurrection. By enduring the cross for us, he destroyed death by death.